Hey there. Today we are talking about the FKA Twigs versus Shy LaBeouf lawsuit. It is a sexual battery, battery assault case. And before we jump into it, before I introduce myself, the allegations in this lawsuit are just that. They are allegations. This has not been proven in a court of law. This is the first step in a lawsuit. Today, I'm going to talk about what the lawsuit says and then what the New York Times reported was LaBeouf's response. This case does deal with facts of domestic violence and domestic abuse and an abusive relationship. So if that is going to be triggering or upsetting in some way, this might not be the right video. I'm also linking some resources down below. For those of you that know me, I was a deputy district attorney for over 10 years and dealing with cases with relational violence is something that I had some experience with. So in my comments today, we're just going to talk about the pattern that is pointed out in this lawsuit. It seems to be one of the goals of this lawsuit is to really bring light and raise awareness, not just to this particular defendant, Shia LaBeouf, but also to how this happens in relationships in general. So with that said, hi there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker. I'm the badass lawyer, host of The Emily Show podcast, and I am a legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories that we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. And, and I am a big fan of the cursey words. So headphones are always recommended if you are around little ears <laughs> that are sensitive to the cursey words. I mean, they could be big ears that are sensitive to the cursey words, I suppose. So we're just going to jump right into this. The way I break down all of my suits, talking about, well, all of my suits, all of the suits that we cover here on this channel, and talking about what this is. I have not seen this broken down a lot. I have not seen it reported on a ton after it initially came out. So today we're looking at everything in this complaint. Once again, these are all allegations and we are just jumping in. This was e-filed. This is in the Superior Court of Los Angeles. This is the first step in a complaint. It gives you what the complaint is for, sexual battery, battery assault, IIED, which is intentional infliction of emotional distress and gross negligence. Um, this is FKA Twig's given name. I am using her stage name or performer name just out of ease, but we can also call her plaintiff or Miss Barnett. Shia LaBeouf is going to be defendant because as you can see, the person suing is the plaintiff. The person being sued is the defendant. This is a civil case. This is not a criminal case. So this is a person suing another person for damages based on the facts alleged. And this suit, y'all, we've covered some suits that come out strong. We've, co we've covered suits that come out swinging. Let me just give you a, before we dive all into it, I'm just going to give you kind of a brief, brief first take of this. This is serving two purposes. Yes, it's a lawsuit, but it's also a way for the story to be told. There is litigation privilege Things said in a lawsuit generally cannot be defamatory, not generally cannot be defamatory. They're said in the course of a lawsuit. Yes, they have to have substantial proof that they are true. Yes, they have to be proven in court. But you can say things in a lawsuit that might be harder to put out in an article for a publication or speak about in public because there are some additional protections there. So keep that in mind. This is a, a story that is being told not in a story, and I'm implying that it is not true, again, allegations, but this is written in a way to tell you what happened in this relationship from FKA Twigs's perspective and as a warning. And there are elements of this that very much break down like a traditional um, abusive relationship cycle of violence. There's quite a lot here that I will point out some of those things that I saw as characteristics in things that I studied and in cases that I worked on and in knowing uh, women who have been in relationships like this. And again, 
Uh, domestic violence and relational violence can happen in any type of relationship. It is not something to be ashamed of. It is something that you can reach out for help for if you are in a relationship that is not healthy for you. And let's jump back into this. This comes out strong. It comes out strong because it is written with a point to tell anyone reading this or covering this the story. And the story is that as it says in paragraph one, Shia LaBeouf hurts women. He uses them. He abuses them both physically and mentally. He is dangerous. For too long, LaBeouf has sought to excuse his reprehensible actions as the eccentricities of a free-thinking artist. Even though his history of violent behavior was well-documented, many in the media have treated LaBeouf as a harmless figure of fun, which has helped enable him to perpetuate his cycle of abuse of women over the years. There is nothing funny about the exploitation of and battering of women. This action has been brought not for personal gain, but to set the record straight and to help ensure that no more women must undergo the abuse that Shia LaBeouf has inflicted on his prior romantic partners. The days in which LaBeouf can mistreat and harm women with impunity are over. It comes out strong. This gives you exactly the point of this suit. This is to make a point. This is to share um, the experience, to share the story of what happened here. And as a warning, and you can definitely get the sense that this is being told as a warning. These are personal affairs. I'm sure there was a lot of stress and anxiety over bringing this. And as we get into this, we learn that this was attempted to be settled uh, between the parties before this was brought into a lawsuit. Not uncommon in lawsuits that there will be a demand of some sort before anything is ever filed. Oftentimes, you don't just like go file a lawsuit and serve the other person and be like, surprise, lawsuit. You normally reach out and say, okay, we would like you to do this or to stop doing this. And if you don't want to work with us, then we're going to sue your ass. That's generally how that works. And they put that all into the complaint. So we learn what they are saying happened in the background before this came to court. Talia Barnett, professionally known as FKA Twigs, is an internationally successful singer, songwriter, actor. She was involved in a tumultuous relationship with LaBeouf shortly after they finished working on the motion picture Honey Boy, after LaBeouf had employed his or a charm offensive on her, a tactic she now knows he used on other women. Again, this is not uncommon in tumultuous relationships that they start out with very sweet and almost overwhelming um, signs of affection and quite a lot of um, charm and romance and big gestures, not uncommon. LaBeouf convinced her to move in with him. LaBeouf was engaging in grooming, gradually gaining her trust and confidence with the intent of abusing her. What followed was a living nightmare for her. Over the course of months, LaBeouf engaged in a continuous stream of verbal and mental abuse towards her, belittling her and berating her after the slightest perceived insult by him. LaBeouf isolated her from her friends and family, making it so her daily existence and routine revolved around him and only him. This is also not uncommon. The gradual isolation from family and friends is very very common in abusive relationships. And that is relationships that are both um, mentally and physically abusive. That isolation becomes a key component. And often what I saw in talking to people and even in studying some in law school, knowing I was going into criminal law was that there is this um, often desire that the abuser becomes like the center of the world and the partner revolves around them, but then they kind of gaslight them to go, no, no, you're the center of my world and I can't exist without you. And don't you see how much I love you? And I love you so much that I act like this. And then around and around it goes. And then there's always this contrition phase of, oh, but I'm so sorry, this will never happen again. I just get so crazy because I, I love you so much and I, I can't do anything without you. And then there's this continual cycle of that. And then the gaslighting within that cycle and the isolation leads the victim to even question if they're experiencing what they're experiencing. And that can be very disorienting for people. So she was isolated by him 
according to this complaint. They then go on to state in the complaint that his verbal abuse escalated into physical abuse during which he became increasingly violent towards her. On one horrific occasion, Valentine's Day 2019, he forcibly slammed her against a car and then strangled her after she was trying to escape from one of his manic tirades. In fact, LaBeouf even admitted to other women whom he was cheating on her with at the time that he had dragged her out of the car by her collar. He kept her in a constant state of fear by openly storing firearms throughout his home, including in the bedroom, which he shared with her. Finally, and most dreadfully, he knowingly transmitted a serious illness to her without ever informing her beforehand that he suffered from this dreadful malady. This is full of the lawyer words like this. When we talk about well-crafted complaints, this is a well-crafted complaint because it is a complaint laying out the facts of a um, of the allegations that they're going to get into, but it's also very easy to lay out the story and you understand, which means when a judge reads this and if these things are proven true in court, it almost reads like an opening argument peppered in with the understanding of what was going on here and really paints that picture, which again is strategic in a lawsuit. So this comes out where you well and understand what is being alleged from her side. She has since learned that LaBeouf has infected other unsuspecting women with his disease. Simply put, LaBeouf's reckless disregard for the health and safety of his partners makes him a danger to women everywhere. Although she suffered greatly and will bear the scars of LaBeouf's abuse for the rest of her days, she will not be labeled a victim. Instead, she has triumphed over LaBeouf's abuse and stands ready to hold him accountable for his actions. Together with uh, Carolyn Foe, who, or Fa Foe, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. I apologize if I am not. She is another um, ex-girlfriend, and here they also list her as another survivor of his abuse. She, FKA Twigs, she sought to avoid this action by requesting LaBeouf voluntarily seek the mental health and substance abuse treatment he so desperately needs, and that he make a donation to a domestic violence shelter. Talia and Car uh, Carolyn simply wanted LaBeouf to take affirmative steps towards healing himself and in turn to stop his cycle of domestic violence towards his future partners and keep them from suffering the same physical, sexual, and mental abuse. In response to this peaceful overture, the peaceful overture again being the demand of, hey, if you do this, we will not have to do this. This does not have to play out publicly. LaBeouf, they allege, played games and downplayed the seriousness of the situation. LaBeouf's attorney cruelly dismissed the sexually transmitted disease LaBeouf had infected her with as, quote, not that bad. LaBeouf attempted to dissuade the ex-girlfriend Carolyn from allying with Talia and sending Carolyn an unsolicited email in which he falsely disparaged uh FKA Twigs, LaBeouf also threatened Talia, claiming that he was in possession of personal text messages and other information that he could use to embarrass her. In his effort to intimidate her, LaBeouf engaged her former assistant, someone named Noelle O'Reilly, into improperly providing him with private and confidential information about Talia. With these threats, LaBeouf clearly hoped to terrorize her into submission and keep her from taking any further action, like you know, this lawsuit. LaBeouf's scare tactics will not work. He has no power over Talia anymore. I imagine that some of these sentences were very particularly important to her, um, stating affirmatively, literally for all to see that he does not have any power over her is a big statement for somebody who has been in a domestic relationship, a violent relationship like this. And again, these are allegations, but also she is saying that this is her experience. And when we get to LaBeouf's statements, he said, is it's not really for me to say what anyone else's experience was or what their feelings are. But there are some very big uh, statements in here that this is a triumph over him, that that she will not be labeled a victim and that there is no power there anymore, which is why she is bringing this. She now brings this action to seek some measure of justice, not simply for herself, but for many other women who have been similarly abused by LaBeouf. And I also imagine sharing this story with 
other women from a place of celebrity is a way to open the conversation and hopefully start taking some of the shame out of having these conversations and out of seeking help to get out of relationships like this one um, is alleged to be. Talia intends to donate a significant portion of any monies received in this action to charities dedicated to assisting victims of domestic violence, again, stating their intentions, which in a complaint is not necessary. Like this is not a foundational ground for a complaint. These parts of the introduction are making it clear what the intention is here and also letting the court and everyone else know that they did try to do this before bringing it to court. Never again will another woman be forced to undergo the brutal treatment and degradation that Talia and others experienced at his hand. This continues. This case is being brought on behalf of all those women that LaBeouf has mistreated in the past and for all those women who will be spared his abuse in the future. They get into parties and jurisdiction very briefly. Plaintiff um, is an individual residing in London. LaBeouf lives in Los Angeles, California, so the court has jurisdiction over him. We've talked a lot about jurisdiction on this channel, but this, that the acts occurred in Los Angeles County, so that gives the court jurisdiction over the acts, and the person and the plaintiff can choose to sue there, which is appropriate. Facts common to all causes of action. This will lay out all of the facts, and then it will be alleged in each cause of action essentially per the facts above, it goes to this. Per the facts above, it goes to this. So this lays out all of the details over a, a number of pages. Also, I'm just going to say, I appreciate a heading. They, when I say the writing in this is very clear, the writing is very clear. This is a well-laid out complaint, making it very easy to follow what is being alleged and what they are saying happened here. Talia first met LaBeouf while filming the picture Honey Boy in summer 2018. After shooting, they became involved in a romantic relationship. She was in a vulnerable and sensitive state, it alleges, at the time, as she had recently ended a four-year engagement and was recovering from having painful fibroid tumors removed from her uterus. And this engagement, I believe, was to Robert Pattinson. Um, within a week or or two of dating, LaBeouf dramatically professed his love for her during the first few months of their relationship. He restrained himself to over-the-top displays of affection, eventually winning her trust. Once he had gained her confidence, her living nightmare began. They continue to allege that beginning in and around October 2018, he convinced her to go live with him in his Los Angeles home, that once she moved in, he began regularly exhibiting frequent rage and bouts of jealousy towards her. On a continual basis, he aggressively accused her of dwelling on her former fiance, well-known actor Robert Pattinson, and accused her of rushing into a relationship with him. He then would inexplicably escalate the most inconsequential disagreements, for example, over matters of taste and art, to apocalyptic levels, often forcing her to stay up all night while he verbally berated her for hours on end at her supposed lack of taste. He would take something as innocent as her kissing another man on the cheek in a music video or being polite to a waiter as nothing less than a betrayal, an assault on his manhood, and an existential threat to their relationship. This continues on that he would literally count the kisses she would give him in a given day and berate her if she fell short of the target number, that he would verbally assault her if he placed his hand on her lap and she failed to immediately reciprocate, it goes on to say that he would suffer reoccurring periods of delusions wherein he armed himself with firearms on the belief that, quote, gang members, end quote, were going to break down his door at any moment, going so far as to sleep with these guns. She would be trapped in their shared bed for hours at a time without the ability to even go get up and go to the bathroom for fear she would be shot by him should he wake up suddenly upon her return to bed. His relentless mental and verbal harassment and mistreatment of her eventually led to physical violence. He committed physical acts against her on multiple occasions, even resulting in personal injuries to her, not at least of which was him knowingly transmitting a serious disease, which has forever altered the course of her life. They do not. If you're wondering now, do they ever say what it is? They do not. We are not speculating. We are just going over what's in the lawsuit, but they do not say what it is. You're wondering. I feel you wondering. 
I get it. They don't. Going on, they say that while Talia was living with LaBeouf in his Los Angeles home, she remained in constant fear due to the threatening presence of loaded firearms throughout his home. Beginning in November 2018, he insisted on keeping his front door unlocked and sleeping with a loaded rifle at their bedside. He demanded that she join him while he watched documentaries about murdered women before bed and refused to allow her to sleep with any clothing on. It, they go on to say that in these moments, she would often text friends in the middle of the night to devise a plan to escape his home. Similarly, when he was filming the movie The Tax Collector, in which he played a gangster, he took on the role in real life. And it goes on to talk about the fact that he um, carried firearms in the car, that he allegedly told her that he would drive around neighborhoods in Los Angeles and shoot stray dogs, and that the lawsuit claims that he claimed that he killed the dogs because he wanted to know what it felt like to take a life so he could get into the mindset of a killer, like his role in the movie. LaBeouf knew that she was a great lover of dogs and she is very close to her own dog and that his admission of such wanton animal cruelty profoundly disturbed and terrified her. So this is all going to the underlying emotional abusive aspects of this and the intentional emotional abuse, saying that knowing these things and doing these things is this setting up this pattern um, of abuse that is alleged in this case. It gets into the Valentine's day incident in February, 2019. They went to a hotel spa for a romantic evening. They allege that it turned into a not a night of romance, but was instead a night of physical abuse that after she went to bed, she awoke with him towering over her and violently squeezing her body and arms against her will that he then grasped her, his hands around her neck and began strangling her while whispering, quote, if you don't stop, you are going to lose me, end quote. She alleges that she was terrified, could not move, and lay there frozen while he continued to harm her. It gets into the next day when he was driving her back to Los Angeles that she tried to get out of the car at a gas station and leave with her possessions that she was attempting to escape at that point, but that he, after she tried to remove herself and her belongings from the car, he violently attacked her. While in the gas station parking lot, he threw her against the car and attempted to strangle her violently while screaming in her face, and that he forced her back into the car. Um, later, when confronted about this incident by a female friend, on September 29th, 2019, LaBeouf did not deny that he used violence against Talia, and they go on to talk about text messages between him and an unidentified female, saying that in response to the friend inquiring about it, the text back was, quote, Shia, you did actually admit to me the incident where you had her by the collar and you were pushing her against the car while she sobbed and while three male witnesses did nothing at the gas station was true. So that is a quote from what they're purporting to be a text message. Shortly after the Valentine's Day incident on February 25th, 2019, she reached out for help texting a close friend, this is Talia, saying, quote, this is difficult for me to say, but I'm sure you know, I've been in an abusive relationship that has isolated me. It's worse than you could imagine. Talia also sought help from a professional therapist, writing to him on February 24th, I have just left an emotionally, physically, and sexually abusive relationship. I have one day out and I am very confused and overwhelmed. I am writing this email because I hope that by seeking professional help, I can stay out of it and carry on with my life. It goes on to talk about her continual um, seeking of therapy and that she is suffering from mental trauma and distress. This again goes to that intentional infliction of emotional distress cause of action that we see below. She also says that she began to slowly distance herself from LaBeouf and his violence. She began this process by planning to escape him when the opportunity arose. However, his fixation on controlling and surveilling her made the prospect of escape both difficult and dangerous. Then it talks about a March 2019 attempt to escape where she was packing her bags intending to leave Los Angeles. But that while she was doing so, he showed up unannounced at the rented home where she was staying and that her housekeeper witnessed 
um, their fight at that time, and that the housekeeper has provided sworn testimony that LaBeouf yelled at her, that she had to come with him, that she hesitated and remained where she was in the room, that when she refused to go with LaBeouf, he appeared to grow angrier and move toward her. LaBeouf then violently grabbed her and lifted her off the ground. The housekeeper further relates that after he lifted her into the air and forcibly carried her into a separate room, that the housekeeper heard the door um, to this room lock from the inside, that the housekeeper tried the door, confirmed it was locked, and LaBeouf continued to scream at Talia. He yelled so loudly that the housekeeper is saying she could hear him from the outside, that she waited outside while this occurred. LaBeouf kept yelling at her for a considerable amount of time. Eventually, the housekeeper observed LaBeouf open the door and exit the room where he had been keeping her. As he left the room, LaBeouf first appeared to notice the housekeeper watching him. LaBeouf stared at the housekeeper and said nothing. Finally, Talia's housekeeper testified. They say, quote, I quickly went to Talia's side to see how she was doing. I observed that she was in a traumatized state. She appeared to have been crying and her voice was very weak. I asked her if LaBeouf had taken her into the room and kept her there against her will. She confirmed that he had indeed done so. Unfortunately, LaBeouf soon returned, dashing Talia's plans to escape from him. It gets into what happened in March 2019 that at that time she began experiencing um, painful physical symptoms, that she confronted him about the symptoms, and he admitted that he suffered from a sexually transmitted disease, which had been diagnosed years earlier. He admitted that he had never told her about the condition, even though they had been sexually intimate for many months. Furthermore, LaBeouf admitted that he had experienced a flare-up of his disease symptoms in December 2019, but worked to hide his outward symptoms from her by applying makeup. They allege that despite experiencing a flare-up of his symptoms, he continued to engage in sexual relations with her, further exposing her to the disease. It goes on to state that she was shocked and horrified by this revelation, that she consulted with her physician who performed blood work and confirmed that she had been infected with LaBeouf's disease. Tragically, Talia later learned that she was not the first person that LaBeouf had transmitted his disease to and that she discovered at least one other woman that LaBeouf had been in a relationship with who had contracted the disease from him and that he had engaged in similar attempts to hide his condition from that person while engaging in sexual relations. It goes on a little bit to talk about what is essentially gaslighting that LaBeouf tried to convince her that he was the victim, that he loved her, that he wanted to fix their relationship, that they um, engaged in therapy to try to salvage the relationship, but that that did not work. And then eventually when Talia refused his endless stream of calls and text messages that he ended their relationship with a text. She later learned, according to this, that he had been cheating on her with another woman during this time and that finally free from LaBeouf, she began the long and difficult process of healing. It then lists a prior history of abuse for him, which for the complaint, it doesn't directly go to the charges, but I also understand that they are the point of the complaint for the plaintiff is to bolster their case. So they list out several incidences of LaBeouf's behavior towards others and then news articles. With that, it gets into his relationship with Carolyn in 2010 and 2011 and some very uh, difficult incidences that mostly seem fueled by alcohol because it is mentioned in all of these, including um, an incident where he had passed out and she put him in the shower and then she went to bed, woke up that to find Shia LaBeouf holding her down. Um, and as it says here, Carolyn awoke to LaBeouf on top of her drunk, naked, wet, and screaming because she had put him in the shower he had held her down by her arms, causing intense pain, leaving multiple bruises, and then headbutted her violently, causing her to bleed on the hotel bed. And then it gets into a um, disagreement that they had at the Chateau Marmont, where Shia LaBeouf, say, walking away um, to his ex-girlfriend, Carolyn, you know I'm going to kill you. And then once home, apparently he vomited in the hallway. They finish this section out saying Carolyn has bravely chosen to ally with Talia against LaBeouf in order to protect women from ever again having to endure LaBeouf's abuse. 
It then gets into other documented um, arrests or acts of violence along with the newspaper articles that go into them, a Hollywood Reporter article, page six USA Today, showing or purporting to show that he had been arrested in multiple different locations for different types of behavior, all of these involving alcohol. In 2015, there's an incident with a girlfriend at the time named Mia Goth. There is um, another statement from a bystander hearing Shia LaBeouf say, if I'd stayed there, I would have killed her. Then it gets into Talia's former assistant and the relationship between FKA Twigs and her former assistant. And then when that relationship went south, LaBeouf trying to use the assistant to get information they're alleging to threaten her to kind of stand down in this lawsuit. And it gets into the behavior of the assistant, whether the assistant stole from her, um, what the assistant was doing, that the assistant was using Vestair Collective to try to sell clothes that purportedly belonged to FKA Twigs on um, Vestair Collective, which is like a Poshmark resale site for like the bougier folk, (laughs) celebrities. Um, It's the one that Erica Jane had been using that I've talked about in the Girardi suits and that the proceeds from the sales of those clothes were going to the assistant. And it goes through that relationship. Um, I think this section is largely to head off any uh, potential arguments that came up in the press, either from anything LaBeouf had Uh, threatened to release or anything that might be released. This gives you the entire story from their perspective of the backstory with the assistant. And they put earlier in the complaint that there was concern that LaBeouf had said, you know, I'm not taking this seriously, essentially. And I have embarrassing information from you that I obtained from your assistant. So this whole section kind of cuts off that argument and were anything additional to come out. And I don't know if it has, if you know any, if you've seen things like that, leave it in the comments, but it looks like this whole section is to head off that argument. If he tries to release anything that might be embarrassing to her, things that she would not want out in the public or things that he obtained from the assistant because the complaint alleges that he threatened to do that. So this heads that off before it happens, knowing that this would be now filed and out in the public realm. And that gets into all of the stuff about the assistant. And that at the end, undeterred by LaBeouf's shameful threats and determined to keep more women from being ensnared and abused by such a dangerous man, Talia was pressed forward with Talia has pressed forward with this action. If LaBeouf will not help himself and address his own demons, Talia will do everything in her power to keep him from hurting others. Talia has nothing to gain professionally from this action. She intends to donate a significant portion of the money she receives from LaBeouf to deserving nonprofits aimed at helping survivors of domestic abuse. Most importantly, women everywhere are now on notice that LaBeouf is not the tortured artist he portrays himself as. He is a destructive and dangerous man. And that really is the point of this suit, getting this information out there, and then suing for the damages, including the sexual battery, which in this case is the transmission, the unknown to her transmission of whichever sexually transmitted disease they are referring to. Then it gets into the other causes of action, the battery cause of action, which are pled out in the different paragraphs. They've list which paragraphs they're pled out in. The assault action, which is again pled out in paragraphs one through 54, they list the elements of assault that he, you know, touched or assaulted in a harmful manner, that it's assault of contact, that it caused severe emotional distress. Then getting into the intentional infliction of emotional distress, listing out that she has suffered severe and emotional distress based on his pattern of behavior that was listed throughout the complaint. And then the third cause of action for gross negligence, paragraphs one through 41, that he had a duty to act with ordinary care and did not and was um, grossly negligent in his care with her. Of all of the charges, the gross negligence is the one that I was like, I don't know how that'll play out in a relational non-marriage setting, but we'll see the others. I can see why they pled them. Absolutely. And then the prayer for relief here at the end, that it is 
for compensatory damages, money damages, punitive damages, which is like the above and beyond, and the cost of the suit, of course, attorney's fees, and then signed by the attorney and served. So when this was filed, I want to get into what happened on Twitter just a little bit because it was very interesting to see. And we get a little more context of FKA Twigs and what she was thinking by what she put out. And then, of course, um, Shia LaBeouf's statement to the New York Times and then my summary of what I what I think of all the things. So on Twitter, when this came out, she said, it may be surprising to you to learn that I was in an emotionally and physically abusive relationship. It was hard for me to process to during and after I never thought something like this would happen to me. And that is um, not an uncommon sentiment from things that I have experienced, which is why I have decided it's important for me to talk about it and try to help people understand that when you're under the coercive control of an abuser or in an intimate partner, violent relationship, leaving doesn't feel like a safe and achievable option. I hope that by sharing my experience, I can truly help others feel like they are not alone and shed some light on how those who are worried uh, somebody they care about might be in an abusive relationship can help because I understand it can be confusing and hard to know what to do. The statistics on domestically abusive and intimate partner violence relationships are shocking. And during COVID, I have been really anxious because I know many victims will have been literally trapped with their abusers with no relief or way to get out. My second worst nightmare is being forced to share with the world that I am a survivor of domestic violence. My first worst nightmare is not telling anyone knowing that I could have helped even just one person by sharing my story. Here are some amazing charities and helplines I recommend donating to and calling if you or somebody you know needs support. And she lists another, um, she lists several supportive options. These are still up on her Twitter. What was very interesting is that other women in the celebrity space did come out and support um, her, which is a very empowering and important thing to do. So Sia came out and said, also, I love you, FKA Twigs. This is very courageous and I'm very proud of you. There was another statement as well um, from Sia who said, I too have been hurt emotionally by Shia, a pathological liar who conned me into an adulterous relationship, claiming to be single. I believe he's very sick and have compassion for him and his victims. Just know if you love yourself, stay safe, stay away. And so that was definitely uh, words words of support and words of one's own experience with Sia and then FKA Twigs responds saying, I'm sorry, Sia, this reinforces why I had to publicly share my experience. We need to support each other. And that is really what we saw in the foundations of the Me Too movement was women initially taking a stance very publicly and saying, this is enough. I have to talk about it. And others saying, yes, literally Me Too. And we saw that happening with FKA Twigs saying, this was my experience. And Sia coming forward and saying, yes, I've had that experience too. And hopefully this suit opens those channels of communication, not just with women who are celebrities, but with women who aren't celebrities. In talking about this story and sharing experiences is how we start to, I don't want to say normalize, but take the shame out of having conversations about relationships that are not healthy and relationships that are a problem. And that doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman in an abusive relationship. Having conversations about that with people around you can help you not feel so ashamed and not feel so alone. So let's go and look at what Shia LaBeouf said to the New York Times in this article. And this will be linked, of course, in the description. So you can read the whole thing for yourself. He emailed the New York Times and made a comment. The New York Times says that Mr. LaBeouf responded Thursday to the concerns raised by Miss Barnett and a second former girlfriend who accused him of abusive behavior in an email that broadly addressed his conduct. Quote, I am not in any position to tell anyone how my behavior made them feel. He said in an email to the New York Times, 
quote, I have no excuse for my alcoholism or aggression, only rationalizations. I have been abusive to myself and everyone around me for years. I have a history of hurting the people closest to me. I'm ashamed of that history and I'm sorry to those I hurt. There is nothing else I can really say. So there's that. Um, This goes on to say that his representative did not immediately respond for a request to comment to the lawsuit. And then the article goes on to say that when presented with a detailed account of the claims that the women made against him in interviews and subsequently in the lawsuit, Mr. LaBeouf responded in a separate email and wrote that, quote, many of these allegations are not true, but he continued, he owed the women the opportunity to air their statements publicly and accept accountability for the things I have done. He also added that he was, quote, a sober member of a 12-step program and in therapy, going on to say, quote, I am not cured of my PTSD and alcoholism, he wrote, but I am committed to doing what I need to do to recover. And I will forever be sorry to the people that I may have harmed along the way. What's interesting to me is that it seems that those are the things that were asked for prior to this suit being filed in a public way. I don't know if this suit will bring healing for the parties involved. Hopefully it will. It sounds like at least something has happened in that um, Shia LaBeouf is in a 12-step program. It seems that a lot of the allegations in this complaint centered around substance abuse. I think that the complaint does very well lay out what a cycle of domestic violence looks like, which is why I went through the allegations so deeply. It also talked about the difficulty leaving, which is something I know that as prosecutors of domestic violence, which is something I know that prosecutors of domestic violence struggle to help juries understand quite a lot is this, well, why didn't they just leave? Well, why? You know, if this happened to me, I would just go. Like that attitude for a lot of people is very difficult sometimes to overcome in the criminal court system. And so talking about it in such a public way, I think is a tremendously brave thing to do. Again, these are allegations, but they are now out there. Putting allegations out there means that every time FKA Twigs goes to look for a job, um, goes to maybe sign a new contract with a new record label, what she does in the future, she does not know if she walks into a room and this is what's in the back of somebody's mind. And it was important enough to her to get this information out there. She says to protect others that it was worth rolling the dice on that. And often when you put things, um, very personal things, particularly for women in the abusive or sexually abusive space out into the public eye. It is not always taken with a, you're so brave, good for you. There is often a lot of criticism, and she might have received that in this. I have not seen that, but there is often skepticism and criticism, and there's a lot of the, well, why didn't you just leave, and you have all the money in the world, and you're a famous celebrity. The thing is, at the end of the day, we are all people. And I imagine being in a relationship like this as a celebrity can even be more isolating because there are additional considerations to how to leave if you can leave. And there's also more time. People who aren't, I mean, COVID has changed this too, but if you're not working in a typical way where your um, relational partner is not leaving the house every day, the opportunities for you to make plans to leave become harder. And that is something that we're seeing going on with COVID. So in all of it, I know that the attitudes of, well, why didn't you just leave are difficult to overcome. And I think breaking that down in this complaint achieves the goal that she set forth on Twitter of awareness and of seeking justice for herself. So I'd love to know what you think about it in the comments. Again, these are allegations. Take them as such, they have not been evaluated by a jury. They are things written in a complaint that is protected by litigation privilege. But we've also seen a statement by Shia LaBeouf, and the statement stands on its own, and it says what it says. So I will link the New York Times article. I would love to know what you think. Um, I didn't ask you to do the YouTube things, but if you've gotten to the end of the video and you want to do the YouTube things, go ahead and like, subscribe to the channel, YouTube things. <laughs> this is what we do here breaking this kind of stuff down. And of course, you can find me all over the interwebs at 
the Emily D. Baker. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you in the next one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. So if you're ready to ride it on, head over to lawnerdshop.com, your place for all your lawnard needs, stickers, t-shirts, sweatshirts, and more coming soon. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnardsunite.com, happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube 